Where to begin? Um, we waited a long time to chat with uh, Bob Haldeman, and now we have the opportunity, and uh, <laughs> the question is where to start. Here you were working, you, you worked four years in, in Washington as Nixon's number two man, Nixon's SOB, as you called yourself. Dick Nixon never went to Key Biscayne without you. He never went anywhere without you. Pretty close to right. What, what you're accusing yourself of is a cloudy crystal ball. That's hardly the mea culpa that the American public thinks it's entitled to. That's the issue. Well, maybe the American public's wrong. I know in my own heart, and I know in my own head, precisely what I did, I know precisely why I did it. Okay. And I know that I made some mistakes. I deeply regret those mistakes. As Richard Nixon's right-hand man, he was the one most often recorded on the tapes, and they destroyed him. I had the rare privilege for four years of serving on the White House staff under one of America's greatest presidents. Former White House Chief of Staff H.R. Haldeman found guilty today on five counts in the Watergate cover-up trial. Do you regret what happened and what you did? Oh, sure. The country lost motion. Uh, a lot of the good things that we were working on in the way of domestic reforms uh, were lost in the mess. Uh, you can't help but regret uh, an aftermath of that kind. A lot of good people had their lives uh, spoiled in the process. John Ehrlichman has finished his statements. He was then uh, returned to the holding room, rather a strange phrase, Nelson. The holding room gives you an idea, idea that they're holding a chemical or a bacterium or something. Former White House domestic affairs advisor John Ehrlichman, four counts, guilty. Uh, the, the references to like an era of criminality or like People there were trying to, you know, rape the country of its democracy. I mean, I just don't see it that way. Chapin was linked in several reports to the Watergate case, alleged sabotage of the Democratic presidential campaign. Chapin today was found guilty of lying to the Watergate grand jury. I don't think that you can take that little piece of history, which may have been the darkest days of Richard Nixon's career, and construct from that a mosaic that tells you all about that man.
Richard Milhouse Nixon do solemnly swear. I, Richard Milhouse Nixon, do solemnly swear. That you will faithfully execute the office. That I will faithfully execute the office. Of President of the United States. Of President of the United States. And will to the best of your ability. And will to the best of my ability. Preserve, protect, and defend. Preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. The Constitution of the United States. So help you God. So help me God. president was in his office here at the White House at 7.30 this morning, before anyone else on the staff, and after only about four hours sleep. He's felt for some time that he could do this job pretty well, and he was eager to get at it. President-elect Nixon today named another longtime aide, H.R. Haldeman, to be a White House assistant. Haldeman, a Los Angeles advertising executive, served as chief of staff for the Nixon campaign. Alderman is the closest thing to an alter ego the president has, noted for his conservative views, his crew cut, and his non-stop home movie taking. It was just an extremely exciting time for all of us. It was terribly hard work and very, very long, difficult hours, but it was exciting because you were building something. There was no great ideological thrust or uh, noble ambition involved in this and no thought at all of, of uh, becoming permanently involved in either politics or government. It was, it was a thing that where I felt it would be an interesting side experience where I could make a contribution and that something that I, would be a learning experience and an interesting experience for me. So that's, that's why I did it. The White House staff, as it evolves, I think you'll find will be smaller than it's been in the past. I know you'll find it'll be probably the youngest one in history, certainly one of the youngest. Also named as a special assistant was another ad man, 27-year-old Dwight Chapin, who served as Mr. Nixon's personal aide. You gotta keep in mind I was 27 years old at that point. And we had just gone through this campaign and I was just waiting to see what unfolded. The day that I went in and interviewed for the job, and I met this young 34-year-old crew cut guy by the name of Bob Haldeman. And Bob Haldeman changed my life. I've never laughed as much as when I worked in the Nixon White House. And the, the sense of humor was the leveling factor. Things, <laughs> messes we would find ourselves in, or whatever it might be. I think a lot of the younger staff people here find that he can far excel uh, them in terms of en energy and stamina. I took a camera on all my trips, a Super 8, and I have quite a collection of film. John Ehrlichman, a 43-year-old Seattle lawyer who directed Nixon's campaign tour, will have a broad advisory role in the Nixon administration. I think this first year will be seen as basically a time of reform. Ehrlichman is the president's chief aide for domestic affairs, under study of Haldeman, whom he has known since college. I was not a passionate Nixon person uh, going in. Probably if, if some college friend had invited me to go advance for John Kennedy, I might have done. <laughs> there were very few illusions about Richard Nixon, I think, among the senior staff, particularly as we got into things. Uh, a good deal of kind of wry humor about his um, mannerisms and his foibles and his prejudices. And, but nevertheless, you, you work for the President of the United States. He's the only president around. Uh, you all elected him. Uh, we all worked for him, and it's up to us to make it work. It was a very unnatural kind of life, and um, you had the feeling you were in the middle of a great, big, brilliantly lighted, badly run television show. Well, I was taking a home movie of this throughout. <laughs> I 
advanced the first trip to Europe, uh, eight countries, and, and uh, I found myself hobnobbing with the King of Belgium and the Pope and all these folks, and, and it got to be very heady very fast. Critics call them the Germans and describe their office as the Berlin Wall. I'm speaking of President Nixon's chief White House advisors, Henry Kissinger, John Ehrlichman, and H.R. for Harry Robbins Haldeman. Everyone these days knows who Henry Kissinger is. John Ehrlichman is the President's Assistant for Domestic Affairs. But H.R. Haldeman's job is not an easy, tidy one to describe. And of the three men, he has been, by his own choice, the least visible to the public is the only one of the three never to have given a television interview until now. His friends talk of his brilliance, his efficiency, his total dedication to the president, and his lack of personal egotism or jealousy. His critics call him cold, arrogant, hostile to the press, inaccessible. This interview was filmed a week ago in Mr. Haldeman's office at the White House. You have no... Um calendar of your own. You, you really follow the president's day, and you're available, as I understand it, from 7 o'clock in the morning on and on and on. What is this do to your personal life? Well, it uh, poses some problems in it sometimes, but uh, I have, fortunately, a, a very understanding wife and, and four very interested and understanding children. Do your sons want you to grow your hair longer? <laughs> I was afraid you'd probably ask that. My, uh, you've probably seen the picture of my sons that we sent out for Christmas, but because uh, my older son has what I would call very long hair, and my younger son has pretty long hair. They don't look like daddy. They don't. You they mean. don't. But uh, I've faced the fact that uh, they're the ones that are in style, and I'm the one that's out of step on uh, hairstyling, and uh, I'm afraid they're right and I'm wrong on that one. You have said, I'm using one of your quotations again, I often find it fascinating to ponder by what standards history will judge Nixon when all the partisan battles are over. Well, how do you think he will be judged? If he has the opportunity to uh, move ahead with what he's trying to do, I think there isn't any doubt he'll be judged as one of the great presidents. on a trip to the moon with the expectation of landing there. Man going to the moon here this morning from uh, this Florida launch complex aboard that Saturn rocket. The rocket will go, uh, will put the men into orbit 115 miles above the Earth for one and a half orbits, and then the third stage will put them on their way toward the moon. talking to you by telephone from the Oval Room at the White House. And this certainly has to be the most historic telephone call ever made from the White House. 
And as you talk to us from the sea of tranquility, it inspires us to redouble our efforts to bring peace and tranquility to Earth. For one priceless moment in the whole history of man, all the people on this Earth are truly one. One in their pride in what you have done. Armstrong is on the moon. Captain Neil Armstrong, 38-year-old American, standing on the surface of the moon on this July 20th, 1969. That's one small step for man. A typical day for me, Haldeman would pick me up around 7.15. He, the car would get Bob, then it would get Larry Higby, Bob's aide, and then it would swing by my house and they'd end in the White House. I am responsible for the scheduling and also for the president's daily activities. Our thing was a machine and I knew my place. It really reflected a lot about Richard Nixon the degree to which he wanted things controlled. It literally was from 6 o'clock in the morning until 9 o'clock at night, every day of the week, and Saturdays and Sundays, too. And that pace was unremitting, totally consuming for somebody like me. I was very tough on people, feeling that I had to be. There's something about the presidency that I've been ridiculed for my picking up the Navy term of zero defects, but you do have to operate at as close to zero defect as you can. And I was not overly concerned with whether people liked me as a result of it or not. I was only concerned that the result the president wanted got carried out. Why didn't you burn the tapes? Surely you talked about it. Well, I, the question came up at one point, should the tapes be destroyed? And my strong recommendation was that they should not be destroyed. That was a mistake, wasn't it, Mr. Holmes? Yes, sir. 
I would say that given what we now know and what's now happened, that, that it was a disastrous thing to have done. But there was never a thought that one word of those tapes would be played in public or be played to other people. And when it got to the point of having to release them, uh, or of having even to consider the possibility of releasing them, they should have been, in my opinion now, it should have been destroyed. I had no idea of, about the taping system. No. no. Uh, did you ever talk to Haldeman about that after the... After no. The Never. John, you didn't know about the, uh, the, tape, Mike, the taping system in the Oval Office, did you? No. Did it come as a surprise? It did. Our White House staff was essentially a dysfunctional organization. I think Nixon believed that he didn't have to share every piece of information with everybody. Listening to the tapes is very revealing because he's talking to others about me and what I should know and what he didn't want me to know. And he did the same thing with Kissinger and the same thing with a lot of people. Um, several times I, I recall his saying to me, don't tell Henry. He kept little watertight compartments of information and it didn't work very well. Dan Rather, who has closely observed the Nixon presidency, reports now on the first year in office. In 12 months, Richard Nixon proved himself to have been underestimated. He emerged as a shrewd political manager with a chance to be remembered as a consummate politician in the mold of Woodrow Wilson or Franklin Roosevelt. Nixon, the supremely disciplined, introspective loner, his mind methodical, cautious. Given to worry, yes, but never, never let the worry show. Control, the byword for every public appearance, calculated non-flamboyance. Makeup to cover the beard, special hair tonic to cover gray at the temples, and a ready smile to cover worry. One year does not make or break any president. A first year does set directions. What the past year has proven is that the principal directions of the Nixon presidency are cutting back commitments abroad, reforming the machinery of government at home, and laying political foundations that will have Republicans replacing Democrats as the majority party in the decade ahead. President Nixon's primary focus, his own personal attention, was almost totally dedicated to ending the war in Vietnam. Nixon tried to move into his committed areas of welfare reform, uh, some areas of economic reform, and all that. But the one factor which really totally overrode all of those factors was Vietnam. had been in the office, in, in the president's office, several different occasions where he had a handkerchief out and was wiping tears out of his eyes and he'd been there writing notes to parents, the kids had been killed. So I came from it that the president was doing the very best he could and that he was trying to end it. And that he, and, and so I, I didn't have much compassion for the people in the streets. I respect their right to demonstrate because that's, you know, that's what the country is about. But I mean, I was of the opinion that the demonstrators prolonged the war. They didn't help us get out, they made it worse. And that's just how I view it. <laughs> Are you home or at the office? No, I'm still at the office. Oh, that's too bad. Too bad. Uh, 
With regard to this matter, Bob just raised with me just before I came over at the house with regard to the what we do on the things tomorrow. Just a second. Yeah, but let's face it, it isn't as bad as Berkeley has had or San Francisco's had yet. I, I think that you can expect that these people will be in very massive numbers and that probably the police department will be swamped. They will not be able to handle the numbers. What do you mean, massive numbers? Oh, I think uh, in any uh, one of these 20 intersections, you'll have uh, anywhere from uh, 700 to 1,000, 1,500, something of that kind. Who's organizing them? This is the... uh, it's a highly structured uh, operation. It's it's quite beautifully organized, actually, by uh, Rennie Davis and a whole, a whole uh, group of more or less professional organizers that have been at this for a long time. Uh, I think the general conclusion that we've all come to is that we should not call out troops. No, God, no. And that uh, uh, we would don't leave... Don't let us don't have martial war about the war. Or this That's that. Hell no. Uh, we just leave this to Jerry Wilson and the police department to conduct their affairs in the normal way. Marching behind flags and banners and picket signs demanding peace now, at least 200,000 anti-war protesters jammed the streets of Washington today in what was probably the biggest peace demonstration to be held since they began six years ago. Despite the huge crowd, no Nixon administration official spoke at the rally or appeared on the Capitol Hill platform. Last night I had that we are here today because we've been here before, you and I. We've been here before and we've been other places. And what we have to decide is that we're going to keep coming back until this war ends. Yeah. Mr. Ehrlichman, yeah. sir. Yes, sir. I bet Ma Badala, the television, wouldn't show the uh, Rachi ones. Well, they showed some of them, but they softened it a good deal. They didn't uh, yeah. describe the profanity and any of that sort of thing. So I, they came off rather well on television. I think huh? they came off better than they should have, considering what they pulled. Well, there you are. Yeah. Good evening, my fellow Americans. A few weeks ago, I saw demonstrators carrying signs reading, Lose in Vietnam, bring the boys home. Well, one of the strengths of our free society is that any American has a right to reach that conclusion and to advocate that point of view. But as President of the United States, I would be untrue to my oath of office if I allowed the policy of this nation to be dictated by the minority who hold that point of view and who try to impose it on the nation by mounting demonstrations in the street. And so tonight, to you, the great silent majority of my fellow Americans, I ask for your support. I pledged in my campaign for the presidency to end the war in a way that we could win the peace. I pledge to you tonight that I shall meet this responsibility 
with all of the strength and wisdom I can command. In accordance with your hopes, mindful of your concerns, sustained by your prayers. Thank you. And good night. Hello? Yes, sir. That was great. Now, I must say that guy put an awful lot of emotion into it. Well, and, and, and it, I don't know whether it got through. It sure did. The last but, part, of course, was uh, was uh, quite a work of art, to be frank with you. It sure was. To take all of that and to put it, compress it into that, and to say it without being maudlin, and yet to have some emotion in it. You know, it was done with, with the style. It sure was. Now, the calls, I don't, you've talked to him, and did you talk to the vice president? Yeah, I talked to him, and they, of course, Billy Graham. And Graham, I talked to those three because I felt I should. Rockefeller called, well, the yeah. hell with him, but nevertheless. But it was a goddamn good speech. It, it, it was, it, it that, touched people. That thing is coming through, all the way through. You want to give me a little rundown? Sure. Uh, O'Neill at the New York Daily News said uh, it's the most effective job you've done yet. National reviews were impressed with the statement, courageous and absolutely necessary, adequately answered the critics, but retained the flexibility you'll need in the months ahead. Sacramento Union said the best and most effective presentation he's made. It will really get through to the American people. It was honest and sincere. Mm -hmm. And George McGovern didn't like it. He said it hadn't changed anything. That's great. Didn't want him to say anything. Well, what the hell? Doesn't make any difference. So I say tomorrow we just uh, live through the day, and uh, we've heard from only three cabinet officers, which I expected. And uh, well, we have more than that. No, that's all. Rogers, Mitchell, Mitchell, Rogers, Hodgson. I we heard from Connolly, though. That's curious. Not, not to uh, my knowledge. No. Why don't you call him and ask him what he thought of it? Sure. Uh, okay. You want me to call you back then? If you would, yes. Right. Irish night at the White House, a salute to the visiting Prime Minister of the Emerald Isle with dancers from Castle Shannon. Yet the crowd could hardly wait for the truly big event of the evening. The President and Mrs. Nixon ended the suspense in a light-hearted mood. I understand that I'm supposed to make a surprise announcement. <laughs> the difficulty is that Every time I'm supposed to make a surprise announcement, I find that some way it's leaked before I get to make it. <laughs> Even though the information may have leaked out, until I say it, it's not official. <laughs> and so tonight, Mrs. Nixon and I are very honored to announce the engagement of our daughter, Tricia, to Mr. Edward Cox in New York.
And now to commemorate this event, we have as our special guests tonight the Ray Conniff Singers. It's very difficult to describe them. Most of you have heard them. And if the music is square, it's because I like it square. <laughs> President Nixon, stop bombing human beings, animals, and vegetation. You go to church on Sundays and pray to Jesus Christ. If Jesus Christ were here tonight, you would not dare drop another bomb. Bless the Berrigans and bless Daniel Ellsberg. began publishing a partial text of a secretly prepared study in the Pentagon relating to the origins of American involvement in Vietnam. Five days later, the Washington Post began publishing excerpts from the same Pentagon report. On June 22nd, the Boston Globe joined the Times and the Post and published additional material from the study. The documents printed in the papers were classified, which means, according to the government, they were not to be made public. The Attorney General has called a couple times about these New York Times stories, and he's advised that unless he puts the Times on notice, he's probably going to waive any right of prosecution. You mean to prosecute the Times? Right. Hell, I wouldn't prosecute the Times. My view is to prosecute the goddamn pricks that gave it to him. Yeah, if you can find out who that is. A single name has been mentioned most prominently as the possible source of the Times documents. Daniel Ellsberg, a former State Department and Pentagon planner, and of late something of a phantom figure. I think we cannot at all let the officials of the executive branch determine for us what it is that the public needs to know about how well and how they are discharging their functions. Tried it soon I've ever had. Uh, he went, he volunteered for service in Vietnam. He was so nuts that he'd drive around all over Vietnam with a carbine when it was guerrilla infested, and he threw the peasants in the field on the theory everyone in black. Uh, but he's always been a little unbalanced. Late 67, he suddenly turned into a peacenik. At MIT, he heckled me and accused me of being a murderer and being associated with a murderer. All right, all right. The Pentagon report is only the beginning in itself, an incomplete history. There will be much more. The temptation will be great for a witch hunt, the unmasking of villains, and the manufacture of scapegoats. The president was furious, um, Kissinger was furious, it was very intense, <clears throat> uh, it, it was a little like walking on eggshells, I mean it was just a tense, tense time. The irony of Pentagon Papers is that they were not critical of Nixon, they were very critical of the Johnson administration. But Nixon was committed to the proposition that classified documents, secret documents, ought not to be stolen and given away. Some of these documents actually did get into the hands of foreign governments, as well as part of them getting in the papers. And the president and Kissinger were very upset that this man would be doing these kinds of things. You were so mad at Ellsberg, this dirty guy. I don't have to tell you or anyone else that the, that the, the anger and the resentment toward, toward Ellsberg was near hysterical levels in the White House. 
This didn't develop into any pathological hatred of, of Daniel Ellsberg. It developed into a rather cold-blooded and, in my uh, view, uh, 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 misguided uh, attempt to discredit right. Ellsberg in the public eye because, at the time, Daniel Ellsberg was being made a public hero. And there was an effort to try to show that this man was not necessarily the, the great uh, savior of the nation that, that many were portraying him as. I think I changed during the time I was at the White House. I'm not sure whether it was for the better. I think it probably was not at the time that I was there. When you first go in there, at least when I first went in there, I asked a lot of hard questions. Why, why are we doing it this way? What's the What's the justification for this program? Why are we spending this money? Uh, why does this fellow work here? Uh, you know, those kinds of things. After a couple of years, I, I felt like I was defending the status quo rather than challenging it and trying to get it changed and repaired and made better. And that was not satisfying. Oh. I had a very clear sense that I was becoming part of the problem after a while rather than the solution. And I remember one day thinking I had just moved that pile of firewood from over there to over here, and today I was going to have to move it from over here back to over there, and thinking to myself how strange it was to be coming to this historic place and dealing with these great issues, seeing the President of the United States two or three times a day, and feeling like I was just in the business of moving cordwood around. And I thought to myself, well, if it's come to that point, <laughs> it's time I was out of here. Uh, I let Nixon and Haldeman talk me into staying.
be a swinger in New York, Florida, and California, but he should not be in Washington. And he wants us at the White House dinners not to put him next to the most glamorous gal anymore, but rather to put him again near some intelligent and interesting woman instead. Good evening. I have requested this television time tonight to announce a major development in our efforts to build a lasting peace in the world. I sent Dr. Kissinger, my assistant for national security affairs, to Peking during his recent world tour for the purpose of having talks with Premier Zhou Enlai. The announcement I shall now read is being issued simultaneously in Peking and in the United States. Premier Zhou Enlai, on behalf of the government of the People's Republic of China, has extended an invitation to President Nixon to visit China at an appropriate date before May 1972. President Nixon has accepted the invitation with pleasure. For two decades, every American president has been presented to the Chinese people as the arch enemy, as the personification of hated capitalism and imperialism. Most Asians recognize this development as a momentous step that can change the whole complexion of this part of the world. I found out I was going to China from Bob Haldeman. I was the acting chief of protocol for that trip, and uh, it was one of the great mountaintop experiences. I th the, the, th the thing about the, the flight to China was, one of the things was, that it was just kind of surreal. The plane is taking off to go to China, and we've got a television set there watching us take off. I mean, it, everything about that trip was televised. I mean, it was a production from start to finish. The president will journey to Peking in the dead of winter, a season especially severe in the Chinese capital. Following the joint announcement issued at 4 a.m. Peking time, the White House News Secretary re-emphasized Mr. Nixon's stated purpose for becoming the first American president to visit mainland China. As President Nixon has pointed out on a number of occasions, he shall try in the meetings with the leaders of the People's Republic of China to seek a new direction in the relationship between our two countries and to end the isolation of our two great peoples from each other. Four hours after his arrival, Mr. Nixon is taken to meet Chairman Mao Zedong. The fact that Chairman Mao arranged an immediate meeting with the American Chief of State in his home is considered significant by diplomatic observers. It's kind of funny, when I called Sugar and I sat him down in my room and told him that I wanted to meet with the President, at that moment he had left here and was over meeting with Chairman Mao at his residence. Ron was holding a tangerine in his hand, took a bite of it, getting about half the tangerine in one bite, peeling it off. And he was, to say the least, a little startled. Also speculated on all the uh, wild range of possibilities that you have when you're sitting in a the Chinese guest house with Red Army troops uh, guarding you outside. Included is an evening at the Peking Opera to see a ballet, The Red Detachment of Women, that depicts the overthrow of a cruel landlord by female communist partisans. The uh, evening ballet performance was quite an experience. A complete propaganda operation, extremely well done. The uh, interpreter seated behind me explained the uh, ideological aspects of the ballet all the way through and wanted to be sure I understood all of the points. It was a rather odd sight to see the president uh, clapping at the end for uh, this kind of thing, which would have been horrifying at home. But. Uh, it all seems to fit together somehow here. 
The skies have been somber in Peking all day, and in the afternoon, a light snow began to fall. In the city streets, men and women with brooms began sweeping it up, almost flake by flake. And it seemed to have no dimming effect at all on the exuberance of President Nixon and Premier Zhou Enlai in their third long conversation. We all had little ki kids the same age. I mean, people at ice skating parties, there would be, you know, just all kinds of things. And we're in our 30s and we're, you know, living. There were pranks, there were these incredible friendships. And it was our, our senses of humor and our personalities that made it all, you know, nice. Illegal bugging apparently was one of aim of a team which broke into the Democratic National Headquarters in Washington during the weekend, and the political backgrounds of the men charged in the case have kicked up a storm. Barry Serafin has the story. The Watergate Apartment Hotel office complex in Washington has a fortress-like appearance that is noted for its security. But the burglars penetrated that security to break into the sixth floor offices of the Democratic National Committee. Material from files there was found in their possession. Democratic spokesman called the file information very mundane. Here and in the men's rooms in the adjoining hotel, police confiscated extensive photographic and electronic eavesdropping gear, as well as several thousand dollars in consecutively numbered bills. Uh, currently, about five men. Uh, one of them, clearly, uh, under contract and employed by both the Republican National Committee and the campaign to re-elect the president. Uh, this, I thought, this administration was a law and order administration. And I've never seen such a crass violation of individual rights as uh, we have seen in this instance. I must say that it's the uh, legacy of years of wiretapping and snooping and violation of privacy in which the government itself has been too deeply involved. Tonight, 
I again proudly accept your nomination for President of the United States. And let us pledge ourselves to win an even greater victory this November in 1972. President Nixon's victory in the election is surely one of the biggest landslides ever. Let's look at the popular vote now, with almost all of it counted. With 98% of the precincts reporting, it's Nixon 45,800,000. McGovern 28,400,000. This adds up to a record-breaking 521 electoral votes for President Nixon, who won 49 states. McGovern carried only Massachusetts and the District of Columbia for 17 electoral votes. At first it was called the Watergate Caper. Five men apparently caught in the act of burglarizing and bugging Democratic headquarters in Washington. But the episode grew steadily more sinister, no longer a caper, but the Watergate affair, escalating finally into charges of a high-level campaign of political sabotage and espionage apparently unparalleled in American history. The charges center about a man whose very name in Italian is Secrets. Joe Blocker reports. Donald Segretti. Reports in major newspapers say White House aides recruited Segretti for secret intelligence work and dirty tricks against the Democrats. Segretti went to college with several men now in the White House. He was particularly close to Dwight Chapin, and several press reports document recent links between Chapin and Segretti. A grand jury is investigating. Richard Nixon do solemnly swear. I, Richard Nixon, do solemnly swear. That I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States. 
that I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States. And will, to the best of my ability, and will, to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. Preserve and protect and defend the Constitution of the United States. So help me God. So help me God. Phone rings, it's John Dean. And he said, have you given any thought to the, what you're going to do next? And I said, John, what in the world are you trying to tell me? And he said, well, I think you need to figure out what, what you're going to do next. And I said, does Bob know this? And he said, Bob asked me to talk to you. I could not believe it. So the next day, I flew up to Camp David, and Bob met me, and we went over to one of the cabins and talked, and we were both crying. And he said that it looked like I was going to be a political problem to the president because of all this Segretti stuff. And this guy, Sam Irvin, may hold some hearings. And therefore, it's probably better for your career and everything else if you move on. I mean, it was just horrible. I, 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 there's nothing that can describe how I felt. So I sucked it up, said, yes, sir. Went into the men's room to get myself kind of straightened up. And there is the Attorney General of the United States, Richard Kleindienst, bawling like a baby. He had just met with Ehrlichman. I'm thinking to myself, this thing's surreal. I mean, I can't believe this. So I went back, got on the helicopter, and started figuring out my life. Leon Jaworski said, if the American people had not demanded action in the Watergate scandal, it might have grown into outrages as great as those in Nazi Germany. Well, here again, you're, you're into this, this verbal excess thing that it, it just seems to me is, is uh, uh, easy to do after Question. the fact. What was the mentality, what was the mindset in the Nixon White House that led to Watergate? Watergate didn't lead from, the, didn't come from the Nixon White House, and I don't think there was any mindset that led to Watergate. The president is out of office. Men in the Nixon White House went to jail. What was the mindset? What, what happened? That's the problem, Mike. I don't know what happened. The burglary had nothing to do with Richard Nixon at the time that it occurred. If he had kept distance between himself and that whole episode, he didn't know about that in advance, I'm persuaded. I, I've never heard anybody come forward with any evidence that he did. If he had kept distance between himself and that episode and just said, you know, those guys did it, they're going to have to take their punishment. That is what could have saved Richard Nixon, I'm persuaded. A little, little quick surgery. But he was the compulsive minutia man. He had to get involved. He had to... He had to dabble in this, in this uh, 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 conspiratorial uh, uh, spy stuff. And he pulled it all into his office. What's the dumbest thing you did? The dumbest thing I did was, was not to go to him when I realized this and say, look, if you don't go out there and make a clean breast of this thing, I'm going out to the press room and I'm going to tell them everything I know about this and then I'm going to walk out of here. You think you'd have had the courage to do that? Well, obviously I didn't. I just was, I was not playing with a full deck. I just didn't know at the time, uh, one, that there were tapes, two, that he was as deeply involved as he was. Ladies and gentlemen, President Nixon has requested time on the networks this evening for a report on Vietnam. Good evening. 
I have asked for this radio and television time tonight for the purpose of announcing that we today have concluded an agreement to end the war and bring peace with honor in Vietnam and in Southeast Asia. The following statement is being issued at this moment in Washington and Hanoi. At 12.30 Paris time today, January 23, 1973, the agreement on ending the war and restoring peace in Vietnam was initialed by Dr. Henry Kissinger on behalf of the United States and Special Advisor Lee Duc Tho on behalf of the Democratic Republic of Vietnam. Let us consecrate this moment by resolving together to make the peace we have achieved a peace that will last. Thank you and good evening. Parliament, please. Thank you. Yes, sir. I thought you'd be amused to uh, hear that the Eric Severide, Marvin Kalb, and Dan Rather, they were just green, just <laughs> sick. It was a just bad night for Eric. Uh, well, they were all just sick about the fact. They weren't happy about it, that the peace had come in there. They just were pissing on it all over. Mm -hmm. It was, in a sense, it was so masterfully underplayed in the way that, you know, I mean, you, you drop this huge bomb in your first sentence. Right. And uh, there it was, and it just sits there, and I think it just, you know, it's kind of like a thunderclap, and, and, but it was, it was great. That's right. Okay. Very good. Senate Democrats have chosen North Carolina's Sam Irvin to investigate the Watergate bugging case. The committee would have full subpoena power and a half million dollar budget. When it was learned today that some of the Watergate conspirators had been involved in illegal actions relating to the Pentagon Papers case, the whole affair took on a new and more sinister air. Two of the convicted Watergate conspirators, Howard Hunt and Gordon Liddy, burglarized the offices of a psychiatrist of defendant Daniel Ellsberg to get files on Ellsberg. The message of Watergate, as I read it, is the same as the message of the Pentagon Papers. That from the eyes of people who work for the president, all law stops at the White House fence. The entire political system, uh, the entire standard of politics uh, in the country has reached an all-time low. The president and his cabinet and his administration owe this country an explanation, first of all, and secondly, an apology. I don't respect the type of journalism, the shabby journalism that is being practiced by the Washington Post. Informed sources say it was the Watergate prosecution that set off the recent series of explosions and that there are further time bombs in President Nixon's hands. We're in uh, late April of 1973, and I'm really getting beat up in the press. Uh, we're going to make it. Yeah, let me get up here to the door and then I'll... Okay, okay. excuse me. There we are. I'm going to uh, be following the unvarying practice of having no comment on this matter until its final disposition. I have delegations of FBI agents in and out of my office all the time, and all of a sudden it has dawned on me that I have a very serious problem, that Richard Nixon has a very serious problem, that Haldeman and a lot of other people have serious problems. The president flew south to look at flood damage and dedicate a naval training station in Mississippi to Senator John Stennis. In the presidential party were H.R. Haldeman and John Ehrlichman. We're on Air Force One. We were going off to uh, dedicate a John Stennis Memorial rocket launcher or something in Mississippi. And I'm standing on the flight deck. And it occurred to me uh, for about 30 seconds that I could crash this airplane, and that would put an end to everybody's problems. Mine, and Nixon's, and Haldeman's, and everybody, everybody who was aboard.
I stepped off that airplane, and usually the drill is Richard Nixon steps off the airplane and all the cameras click away and all that. He got off, nobody paid any attention to him. I got off, and a boy, you know, they were all taking uh, morgue shots. The very last conversation I had with him there, we were talking about this break-in in California, the Ellsberg psychiatrist break-in. And he said, um, I didn't know about that, did I? And I had to, I had to indicate to him that he did know about it. That, that of course, is a totally, totally out of our ken. Have you ever heard of such a thing? Yeah, sure. <laughs> God damn it, I never heard of it, John. I should have been told about that, shouldn't I? Well, I'm not so sure about what you weren't. My recollection is that uh, uh, this, was, this was discussed with you. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I've got to know about that. I mean, All right, I, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll check, check it if I'm in... I mean, uh... <laughs> if I'm in that kind of a position, I'm in a god. I'm in a position I just didn't know about. Believe me, I, I have throughout this thing. I must say, I've uh, I have not known, as you know, <laughs> I didn't know about the Watergate, and I didn't know about these other But I I knew that we were checking all this. But my God, I didn't know there was a taping device. Now I didn't know there was a taping system in the room at the time. Uh, since then, it's occurred to me that he, that he was talking for the record, among other things. But. At the same time, I, I'm convinced he really didn't know the difference between what was true and what wasn't true at any given moment for a long time in that. And he could, he could persuade himself of almost anything, uh, which is kind of too bad. Hello. Mr. Ziegler calling you? Yeah. Thank you. There you are. Hello, Rod. Yes, sir. I talked to Bob yeah. and told him that uh, your decision was to ask for the resignation and uh, you had uh, thought this through for now three weeks. And uh, I told him that you recognize that their lawyers don't agree with this approach and that they don't agree with this approach, but the president uh, feels clear in his mind now that this must be done, and that's what he wants. And uh, uh, Bob said, fine. He understands. He feels it's wrong decision, but he will abide by it. And. Uh, in terms of John, he said, I think John is going to be more difficult in accepting this. And Bob said, I'll do what I can with John. Good. Big man. He sure is. Big man. You think Adam uh, Ritchie's going to go talk to John, I presume? I'm going to talk to him on the helicopter. President Nixon moved at the highest level today to cleanse the White House of the taint of the Watergate scandal. The President has asked me to announce that he has today received and accepted the resignation of two of his closest friends and most trusted assistants in the White House. In their statements of resignation, Haldeman and Ehrlichman blamed many of their problems on the press. Whether the President plans to incorporate any such statement in his nationwide address tonight is unknown. Today, in one of the most difficult decisions of my presidency, I accepted the resignations of two of my closest associates in the White House, Bob Haldeman, John Ehrlichman, two of the finest public servants it has been my privilege to know. I want to stress that in accepting these resignations, I mean to leave no implication whatever a personal wrongdoing on their part. And I leave no implication tonight of implication on the part of others who have been charged in this matter. God bless America.
And God bless each and every one of you. Hello. Hi. Hope I didn't let you down. No, sir. You got your points over, and now you now you're you got it set right and move on. You're in right where you ought to be. Well, it was a tough thing, Bob, for you, for John, the rest, but God damn it, I'm never going to discuss this son of a bitching Watergate thing again. Never, 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 never. But interesting thing, you know, we haven't heard of the only cabinet officer that is called is Cap Weinberger, bless his soul. Hmm. All the rest of you are waiting to see what the polls show. But let me say, you're a strong man, God damn it, and I love you. <laughs> and I, you know, I love John. We're all the rest, and by God, keep the faith. Keep the faith. You're going to win this son of a bitch. Absolutely. I don't know whether you can call and get any reactions and call me back. Or, you know, I could be old style. Would you mind? I don't think I can. I don't. I no, don't, I agree. I don't. Have an odd spot don't, to try and do don't that. call a goddamn soul. The hell with it. Let me just say, getting this call from me, from you, I, mean, I haven't heard from any cabinet officer except Weinberger uh, an hour afterwards. And thank God, and no staff member. Well, now when I so, called, the board said they were instructed not to put any calls through. So the hell with that. I told them to put all the calls through. Well, that may be why you haven't gotten them, though, because that's the all right. what you told me. I'll change it. I'll change it. Right. Fine, but God bless you, boy. Okay. God bless you. I love you, you, you know. Okay. Like my brother. And we'll all right, boy. Go on and up from Keep here. Keep the faith. Right. Dwight Chapin, President Nixon's former appointment secretary, today was found guilty of lying to the Watergate grand jury investigating political sabotage during the 1972 presidential campaign. I will never, ever, under any circumstance, have a regret for any contribution or any hardships or anything else that have come out of the work that I've done uh, with Richard Nixon. I loved what I did, and it was very important to me. And, and I think these friendships just, you know, are golden, and they still exist. John Ehrlichman, President Nixon's domestic affairs advisor, is behind bars tonight, the highest ranking former Nixon aide to go to prison so far. For myself, I went through a process of being just absolutely stripped bare. I woke up one day realizing that there was nothing left. There just really wasn't anything. And it occurred to me that there might be an opportunity in all of that to do it over again, simpler and better. H.R. Bob Haldeman, convicted for his part in the Watergate scandal, is here to see his daughter graduate from law school. On Wednesday, Haldeman reports to the federal prison in Lompoc, California, to begin serving a two-and-a-half to eight-year sentence. I've spent five years in a legal defense against, uh, first of all, an investigation, and then a, a charge, then a trial, yeah. and then a year and a half in prison. All of that time 
had to work on my defense. The time is, is here to, uh, to stop defending, at least on my part, and to start looking ahead. There's a lot more to my life than Watergate. There's a lot more to my life than politics. Convicted Watergate cover-up conspirator John Ehrlichman is out of a job. The one-time White House aide to former President Richard Nixon has ended his brief career as an ice cream pitch man on television. By all accounts, the ad campaign was simply a meltdown. Try this stuff. It's unbelievable. And believe me, I'm an expert on that subject. The California ice cream company that ran the ad said consumer response was so negative the Ehrlichman commercials were being taken off the air immediately. <laughs> 